talking to RT. This is ME. And I thought that RT had a really interesting point. He was talking about his therapy. Uh, but first, let's kind of get like a little bit of background, just as much as he's willing to share about, you know, how how he would put himself on the psychopathic scale. I often and this is the first time I've talked to RT, too. So uh, I'm I'm learning with you. But some often I ask people, like, where would they put themselves on the, the psychopath scale? You know, one to ten kind of uh, just, you know, uh, you know, not very scientific at all, not scientific at all, in fact. Uh, but just to give you kind of an idea, I would probably give myself like a 8.5 at my peak. And I th would probably say that I'm now closer to like eight, maybe just a little under eight even. Uh, so sorry to put you on the spot right away, RT, but no, do you have kind it, of an it, idea? It, yeah, uh, I would say I was beneath as well. I mean, we did that sort of um, anecdotal test on there and scored a little high on that, but I think that is probably the nature of that test. It's quite um, it's quite effective. I had a look at it. It's quite good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be, it was quite good. I'd say I'd be about an eight now. I'd say when I was younger, I would be 8.5, maybe near a nine. Mm -hmm. But, but um, that's, that's probably more to do with youth as well. So you're talking about the uh, psychopathy is they have a little um, assessment, yeah. kind of self-assessment that you can do. Plus the therapist did some tests with me as well. Oh, okay. Uh, because she did some check, some standard checks to, well, you know what they usually do? They, they go through your present experiences, things you've done in the past, how you reacted to things. And from that, she determined that I was definitely re repeating patterns, making mm -hmm. the same mistakes. Yeah. But what was interesting about that is, even though I know that, I still do it. Right. You so know, I, I'm more aware, but it's still an issue. I was just listening to, uh, I'm a lawyer, and every few years we have to do continuing legal education. And the one that I chose, it, they're all like online seminars right now in the pandemic. Uh, but the one I chose to listen to recently was about borderline personality disorder. And so he was kind of talking about personality disorders in general uh, and kind of talking about, yes, that repeated pattern sort of thing where it's like uh, something that is pretty fixed uh, at least the pattern of kind of the experiences and the pattern of, you know, the behaviors, or let's say the pattern of, I guess, kind of the coping mechanisms uh, or the mechanisms of trying to kind of process through life, you know, like you're going to keep your brain's kind of set up to keep processing information and making decisions in those sorts of ways. And so you're going to continue to see those sorts of patterns because he was talking about from the context of, you know, if you have a, a client, in criminal law who has borderline personality disorder, you know, uh, I guess it's called a mitigation. You can ask for a mitigation of the sentence based on the characteristics, individual characteristics of the person. And he said you could come up with a mitigation report that kind of explains to the court that, yes, there are patterns, but that's because the person's disordered. You know, that's exactly what makes the person disordered is that they have these patterns. And, and rather than the judge saying there are patterns here, there's a pattern here. And so this person's a bad egg. So we need to come down on them really hard because you know that they can't seem to learn their lesson but the reason they can't seem to learn their lesson is because they are disordered that is <laughs> so I think that yeah, I would think that would be it'd be an interest I must remember that should ever need a good defense yes yeah <laughs> it's probably I, seriously it's probably the only the only occasion I think where I would I would admit to being um anything on the the uh psychopathic scale but mm. I think when I was younger, I mean, I, I don't understand why anybody wants to be it, but I, I was talking to someone about this just arbitrarily. And she's a psychologist and she says this, people wanting to be sociopaths is a bit similar to the people who want to be vampires. Uh. You, know, you know, they want to be like, they see it as these twilight and, and vampire diaries and that sort of thing, as opposed to Bram Stoker's original novel. Mm -hmm. So people can see... The, the interesting things in it like and the interesting thing I've noticed between being like psychopath and sociopath you have sociopaths who would be James Bond, Sherlock Holmes but on the psychopathic side they're all pretty terrible mm. and then you've got those dreadful documentaries about those crazy guys in orange jumpsuits who threw their life away because they killed their siblings over teddy bears 
So there's no real attraction to that. But this idea of, um, the, the, she said they see it as a freedom of responsibility and that they don't feel, they would feel guilty about things. Now, I agree with that in the sense that I don't. I mean, I really don't. I used to think when I was younger, they asked me to do a, a, a psychology paper and I did one on the fact that I thought it was only like maybe four, three or four emotions and you mix them together like paint. And that gave you the spectrum of colors that represented the other emotions. Right. And that, that, that makes sense to me, but obviously it was pointed out to me that they didn't. And <laughs> really, I true. People really do feel complex emotions. So, I, and I didn't, um, they, so they, I suppose part of therapy was that as well. Like when I was young as well, I had what they would call behavioral problems. Mm -hmm. Whereas they, I was very quiet as a kid initially and they thought there was something wrong with me. So they sent me for an IQ test and I blew the bell curve. So then they thought, oh, what's going on here? So then they kind of, in those days, it's about a few years ago, they didn't really do psychology. They just sort of tried to work out where you were in the world, what, what was your home life like, stuff like that. And they couldn't work out why someone as smart as me would do the things I did. I also used to do things like, um, I would always be the one at the back. So we'd be doing really bad things and there'd be a ringleader and the ringleader would be hung out to dry. And I'd basically get a slap on the wrist for, for following this bad person. Mm -hmm. You know, that thing with parents always say, you've got them with a bad crowd. Right. And nobody ever asks, who's the bad crowd? So I would have been the bad crowd. The parents were warning people about it. Ah. But again, it was more out of, it wasn't really out of malice. It was just out of boredom, you know, or, or in we, as the French like to call it. I just, if nothing happened, nothing changed for a long time, I would get quite bored. So I would try and stir things up, try and throw a spanner in the works. Yeah. And I like that would, phrase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, that was really what I did. I mean, I, we did, um, various things as kids joy riding stuff like that but um you know i would i did one occasion take it to extremes where i knew this guy was quite unstable so i went in the car with him and sure enough he, he crashed it not too bad but he had another car and the cops came so i had a bottle of whiskey half a bottle of whiskey with me which i quickly drunk half of it as fast as i could uh -huh. I gagged a bit. The reason for that is when they do a breathalyzer, they get that from the breath. But of course, I had to avoid the blood test because my blood alcohol level would have been too low. So, but so I managed to do that, and as a result, I I got off with a caution because they thought I was drunk and wasn't really in charge. But the whole reason I did that was just to impress this girl who was waving the flags at the races. Uh -huh. she'd be about, she'd be about. 26 then I'd be about 15 yeah so my chances were were ludicrous and I knew that but it didn't stop me taking these ridiculous lengths so I got in trouble with that my um my dad was not pleased when he, they found out about that so was it like your dad's car or was it the other guy's um, car it was, it was just another car we, we in those days and they used to have a little pop up in the car and you you had this parcel tape it was like a sort of fibrous parcel tape they had it wrapped it and you could use that to slide in under the top and just pop the, the hood and then hot wire in a car is is was is, is, uh, simple this was a while ago you can't really do it to cars now because they, they look like starships when you lift the hood uh -huh. but, um, <laughs> yeah, so that, that was the kind of thing i would do it was never dreadful i mean i i tended to avoid violence i was never i never shied away from it as such but i seldom instigated it. i came from I suppose you would you would call these places projects. These were not the kind of places you you messed around. But so uh, I suppose it was around then I started to realise that it wasn't just behaviour. I was different. I didn't. I didn't feel. I thought. I honestly thought people made up remorse because it got you off. And I thought it was something that you had when you were very young, like a kid. And as you got to be an adult, you didn't experience it anymore. Mm -hmm. So, so that was where I was in my, in my teens. I was quite, um, um, 
I'm speaking now as the past from where I am now. Back right. then, I didn't have any kind of self-doubt. And it was one of the reasons why the therapist raised this, and I thought it was a good point. Most people have a varying degree of self-awareness. Uh, it varies time and in person. People like me, like us, we have absolutely none. I No self-awareness whatsoever. It's probably why we repeat behaviours, why we do things like you mentioned in your book where you, you got ill, but you didn't do anything about it till you fell down. Right. That kind of thing is because we're unaware. I also like the way you said that we, we have very weak sense of self. I did that. If I was with a group, good or bad, I tended to echo what their behaviour was. So yeah. I, I sort of went along. It's, it's a strange paradox. I could dominate the situation, but I could also go on with the crowd at the same time. Right. The purest example I have is I was on jury duty. And uh, there was two cases I did. The first one was a trafficking, was pretty horrendous stuff. So that was fine. And um, we, we managed to get the guy got nailed for that. But the second one, everyone, he was clearly guilty. But just for the hell of it, I thought if I could do that 12 angry men thing, uh -huh. I could get them off. And I did. Because it was strange. What, because all you've got to do, you know, being a lawyer, all you've got to do is introduce reasonable doubt. Right. And the case was simply, this fellow was delivering phones. He was subcontracted to drive around and give people the mobiles. Uh -huh. And he got caught with a bunch of them hidden in the back of his van, which he was clearly stealing. Oh, yeah. However, the guys were doing it. Well, there was a couple of I think the racist, the security guys and lazy. So instead of waiting until he went back to the depot, they stopped him in the street on the way to the pub. Mm. So I said, well, until he enters the depot, he's still theoretically, possibly could have delivered the phones or forgot to deliver the phones. Right. And I just persuaded all these people of this. And I, I was the foreman. And I remember when, as soon as the verdict was not guilty, the guy literally left the dock and ran out the door. And the <laughs> judge was surprised. He goes, what? You, you could tell everyone was surprised. And that, that was just something I did just to see if I could do it. Huh. I just wanted to see if I could actually do it, if I could persuade people to do it and it was it was quite interesting because they were quite a disparate group mm. but they were under pressure they were in an unfamiliar environment and they weren't comfortable with it and whereas it, it didn't particularly bother me so I managed to do that so there's things like that that I do and um, I only know they're not good things to do because of other people's reactions like I rely on my um, a partner or I or my wife a lot to um as a kind of canary about what i should and shouldn't do she usually gives me things like we go to weddings that i'm not allowed to say because otherwise i'll just say what i think about stuff without much concern about the consequences yeah that's funny because i find that even when i talk to like psychopaths like uh, you know, I, same thing. I can be speaking and be like, I'm not aware that this is like not an okay thing. No, uh, no. but even my psychopathic partner will sometimes be like, you shouldn't repeat that thing you just said about choking your nephew. <laughs> you know, yeah. Cause my yeah. nephew, I, I think he's like a toddler. He really does like to be choked, not like choked in like this, like, you know, yeah. take away his oxygen, yeah. Yeah. but kind of just grab him, you know, like almost like Homer Simpson, Grabbing Bart yeah. Simpson's "Why You Little," you know. Oh yeah. Funny enough, a few years ago in like Scotland, nobody would have cared about that. But culture changes, doesn't it? These days, yes, you can't do anything. Like I went to a conference, and it was um, it was for social workers because I work in IT and was working for this company, and they asked everybody what to do with these extreme cases and have the death penalty. So I postulated, well, why don't we put them in medically induced comas? and just use their organs for other people. Because <laughs> that seems to me a valuable use of time. Of course, everyone turned and they're all, now you get the thing where they all go quiet and you think, ah, okay. So then I just backpedaled and said it was, well, I was perfectly serious. I thought it was a valid way of dealing with the problem. Yeah, that is a really interesting, it's interesting that you brought it up too, because I, hearing that, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense, especially if they wanted to, you know, like I could see, you know, maybe you need to get consent or something for that, but yeah. like, yeah, why? They have perfectly good organs, most of yeah, them. Yeah, just, just wasting them when, when they could go to, you know, other people. So 
so anyway, I, I, um, I entered therapy. I didn't really think it was going to be a value to me because I didn't have a great faith in psychology because it, it seemed inconsistent to me and, and a bit of a pseudoscience. Yeah. But I, I learned a bit more about it because I'd, I'd done bits of it in college. But, but I always find psychology is a bit like wine. Everybody seems to think they know everything about it without actually studying it. Mm. So I actually had a look at it and I went through it and I thought that, yeah, I'll give it a go. So I went there and, and she was very good. I mean, the first thing she did when she, she did a few basic texts and tests and she said that what I said online, she said, I'm not as smart as you, but I could still be a good therapist. <laughs> so, which was, it was disarming. First of all, she appealed to my vanity. Yes. Which, which is another thing people don't know about me as well. I'm actually very vain, but nobody knows it because it's not something I, I, I choose to share because I've become quite wary. I had an incident about three years ago. I'd been in a company for quite a while and there was a, some technical issue we got and it went wrong and we were fixing it. And the project manager I was with was, was terrified that we're gonna get fired or something. And I said, well, they can only fire us. And he didn't like this. So anyway, subsequently mm -hmm. this, I found it, he, was, he was putting rumors about that I was a, a psychopath. You know, this like they had on their, that North pointed where how to spot a psychopath and that right. sort of thing. Yes. He'd obviously read something like this. And so he'd said this. And of course, once people think that, I thought they should just have dismissed it. But yeah. they didn't. They started to think, oh, there's something in this. So I asked around and this chap said, oh, I don't know. And he goes, well, there is this game I play where you have an avatar and you select an avatar from the personality traits of people you know. So it goes, I gave you a sword and used what I thought your personality trait. And I'm one of the best people in the country at this game. Because you're really good at it. <laughs> That's a little unnerving. What do you mean I'm good at it? So then I got wary because seriously, though, you, we do not want to be out. It's like it's like being gay 30 years ago. Yes. The last thing you want is giving people any reasons to be prejudiced against you. Yeah. Well, I mean... I am, I have what's called a Google problem. Like if you kind of Google me, like it's crazy how, how easy it is for people to come up with my real name. And yeah, so I experience it probably every, I mean, like few months or something, people flipping out or, you know, they're, they're just, uh, you know, it's so weird because it's kind of like you say, once, once you get the idea in, in your head, once they get that idea in their head, then everything that they see me do or everything that they hear me yeah. say suddenly is like, well, of course she did this because she's a psychopath, you know, and it, nice. even when I do something nice, it's like, you know, how terrible yeah. that she's trying to like get into our good graces just to manipulate us. It's like, oh, I okay. Know, which is, which is odd, isn't it? Because they think, yes. And, and if anything goes wrong as well, you're the first person you come to because someone was stealing some kit or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I was under, I had nothing to do with this particular department and I was under suspicion. But the irony was that the guy I worked knew me quite well. So my defense was, you think, you really think if I did this, I'd be stupid enough to get caught. <laughs> and it true. So, God, so that, that was quite, I mean, for me, it was, you know, it's fine, but that was a little disconcerting because I've obviously built a life where other people don't know that. I mean, most people, I say now, I'm probably not so sure now, but I think most people wouldn't believe you if you told them. Right. Most people wouldn't. I think all my family would because they all live in a village near, like within a few miles of each other. I live at the other end of the country. Mm. So I'm not really... I'm not really sort of... I don't mind that. Are you like that? I can have relationships with people... And then I don't see them for years and just pick up where I left off. Right. I don't form long attachments unless I work at it. So my current relationship with life is long term because I keep working at it. But I think I would describe it as every one of my relationships is kind of bi coastal, as you Americans say. Mm -hmm. If I'm not uh, if I'm not in contact with people, I just kind of lose them, and I don't really connect unless they make the effort to connect I don't connect again I get on well with every job I've been most of the relationships I've been in but I haven't really contacted any of them 
Yeah, mm -hmm. it's interesting you say that. I did a study abroad in Brazil, right? And one of my friends uh, who's European, you know, she keeps in touch with everybody, everybody that she met there, everybody that basically mm -hmm. that she's ever met. You know, she ran into somebody at a train station, you know, started making friends, and now she's close enough friends with them. They're Spanish that like she mm -hmm. intentionally, you know, plans her, you know, international flights to have a layover in like Madrid or whatever so she can go visit these people. She's so good at you know keeping track of people mm -hmm. and i'm so terrible at it i've never even thought that that is like something worth doing no i, I would i would if i wanted to do that like you know, i'd really have to think about it all the time i think i mean i, I tend to think this chap who, who outed me or attempted to he is quite intuitive yeah. and i've met intuitive people and i mean I, I can fake it because you take a bunch of facts and figures and you, you mix them up and you come to a conclusion and it looks like you've made this leap of logic, but I can't actually do that. I, I am wary of people like that, you know, who, who like your friend, they just seem to know who to talk to and who not to, Yeah. who's safe and who's a risk. I have no, I, I can't do that. I, I have to be, I have to take everyone at face value. I have no idea. I, like I said before in my, my comments, I said to my wife pointed out that, you know, predicting people's behavior from previous experience is not empathy. <laughs> you know, she said it's not the same. It, it's kind of like, it's like, it's like trying to see another color, isn't it? Yes. We, I can, I can't do it. I mean, like this conversation we're having is the most honest conversation I've ever had, probably <laughs> in my life. Yeah. Because you, you, you can't really open up these doors because of, well, as we've mentioned, the cultural problems around them. People assume everything. Like you said, if they found out you were anywhere on the psychopathic scale, irrespective of where, because people don't look that deep into things, they wouldn't care what number you were. The minute they hear the word psychopath, there's all these negative connotations. We're all lunatics cutting women up because of some inadequacy. Right. So... So I probably refer to the self as more as a as sociopathic as in your book because and I do even though the clinical definitions aren't that precise, I would definitely see difference between uh, pure psychopaths and sociopaths. Although having said that, I did look into this and most serial killers who people say psychopaths aren't psychopaths, which made sense to me because they seem to be motivated more by sexual desires or uh, inadequacies in what they believe themselves to be in the power structures. Yeah, it is kind of interesting because, you know, psychopaths don't have, uh, let's say, guilt, but they're not, they're clearly not the only people without like a sense of guilt. And I, I would like to kind of see that explored a little bit more, like who are these people who also act without guilt, you know, but they don't, they don't have kind of the same, like, yes, they do kind of seem to come at it from like a place of deep inadequacy, you know, like, uh, man, who would be a good example? That guy who killed his mom, you know, uh, what was his name? And he said, yeah, he even said, he was like, I should have just killed my mom in the first place. And rather than kill all these women as a substitute for my mom and then finally yeah, kill my mom. Right. And he's like, that <laughs> Empaths are terrifying. Yes, I mean, they, 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 yeah. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of that kind of. Uh, I think they they override it. Or they have some way of, of dealing with it. That, I mean, I would never harm anyone without a reason. I would have to have some demonstrable reason for doing it. You know, and, I would or, never. You know, let me push back on this a little bit because I find myself saying kind of generalities like that. And there's always some one-off thing where I'm like, yeah, I don't know why I did that, you know? <laughs> oh, don't get me wrong. I, I, I very much relate to what you said, but you hear these, you have these like rages that, that are in, inappropriate. Right. I had this thing where, where it was like, we were getting on a train and this, this guy had turned up drunk and he was holding the door of the train and he was making it late and everyone was trying to be reasonable with him. And I just got, I just, sort of walked up and looked at him and went get the fuck away from the door guy you're in the way and it was him and four of his friends but it was like I would say these things to the very short lived that's the thing I would say that's different about the behaviour I've noticed in sociopathic people yes 
I, I have these things, but they're very short lived. They're very personal, and they don't last. I mean, long at all. So, because once it calm down, and my wife knows that, so she's quite wary about uh, if I look like I'm getting mad, like road rage. I'd probably be uh, subject to that. I think things like that would annoy me quickly, and then I just um, uh, could overreact. I think. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> That's interesting because I couldn't ever imagine road rage, but I apparently, and this is something like uh, close friends and, and partners have said about me, is that when I get disappointed with something, they say it's like miserable for them. It just feels like this huge, you know, like rain cloud has just come in and it's just like pouring rain. But I'm always like, it only lasts for like eight minutes, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it doesn't, that's what I find as well. And, and it's like, it is a bit like that. I mean, it's not, I say road rage as an example. It's not like that. It's just that kind of thing I've read that that's what it's like. Mm. Because I don't, um, I don't have sustained, uh, I don't have sustained intense emotions of any sort, really. Right. I, I don't imagine circumstances where I can sustain uh, emotions for, for a long time. Like if, it, if, it, if it's anger or something, it doesn't really last. But, Having said that, as I said, I I can be. Uh, I think once I was in the pub and some guys were hassling us, and I said, "Do you want me to as well?" I'll put my mind to it, and they all went sort of quiet, and they went, "No, no." I was only joking, but they were very wary that I was going to do something to these people. Yeah, which was interesting. Which was interesting because, again, that comes from a lack of self awareness. I don't really know all the time what other people think of me. Yes. I mean, I did find it like there's a, a quote from Robert Burns who said the, I'll spare you the Scottish. Basically, it means the greatest mm -hmm. gift you can have is to see yourself as other people see you. Because uh -huh. then you would know what impression you're leaving behind. So, I mean, that I would say that, that I did like your thing about cycles as well. When you mentioned as you, you get older, we, we do tend to mellow and it, it becomes less... Let's let you go on from 8.5 to 8. I would we relate to that as well. I think now I'm more, I can't say empathic really because, you know, I'm trying to be as honest and accurate as possible. But I'm certainly less, um, I'm less dismissive of other people's, put it that way, I'm less dismissive of other people's reactions. In the past, if I didn't agree with someone, I just dismissed it as as they were just wrong. Yeah, you know, I never, I I, I never really admitted being wrong because, and oh, because I never really saw that as as being the case. Right. That way, I never really experienced that as being the case. Yeah. So uh, I just it wasn't anything intentional, just the way I saw the world. So this, yeah. this mellowing out then, would you say that it does seem connected to, because other people I've talked to, and it sounds like this is a little bit what you're saying, it's, it's kind of a perspective shift. You, you start to see the world and other people being a little bit different. So I've heard, uh, you know, Aria, my, my girlfriend, and uh, I think it was Brad, after he took DMT, yeah. you know, the um, kind of mind altering drugs or whatever, he said, oh, yeah. That, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, that was very interesting. Yes, that was, but yes, that's like excellent. That's exactly what I was aiming for. It's a perspective shift. Yeah. You kind of see things differently. Yeah, that's, that's exactly how I love it. And that's exactly what I describe it. Yeah, because I did try, like, I'd obviously, I, I tried all drugs when I, I was younger, just as, uh, just for, to see what they were like. Uh huh. Uh, I didn't get, I, I avoided getting addicted to them any of them quite deliberately because I can get addicted to stuff. Uh, so I avoided getting too addicted to anything serious, but I did try them all. I tried everything uh, just, just to see what they were like. I did like hallucinogens. I did like the, the hallucinogens, I must admit, and things like LSD because they, they're really fascinating. They, they, I don't know if you've tried it, but the the uh, hallucinations on LSD are unbelievable. They're like movie special effects. Really? They're, really, they're like very, very real. I mean, really real. They're, they're like virtual reality. You, you can't tell the difference between one and the other. Uh, I did read a paper that, that said that you know, people with psychopathic tendencies should be wary of taking these things. But I think that kind of came from old 19th century stuff that somehow were Jack the Ripper. So I didn't have particularly bad images 
I just had some interesting ones. But yeah, so I tried that. Um, I <laughs> I was going out with a girl who was sort of friends with a drug dealer. Mm-hmm. So try all this stuff at the parties. I could have just paid for it, but I didn't. <laughs> I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I've tried that. Yeah, that's, that's very good. I remember that from Brad's interview. I did think that was very interesting. Yes, it's a kind of a, a shift in perspective. It's difficult to put into words, isn't it? It's a kind of shift in perspective. You become more aware of that other people have a different viewpoint. Yes. It, it could also be, so. Oh, it is interesting, too. I think that, uh, you know, we both have been interacting with some people on uh, Discord. Uh, and I think you can mm. kind of tell and you can kind of see other people tell, too, that there are, you know, let's say, like, people who have gone through that shift in perspective and people who have yeah. not. And there is a difference. And in some yeah. ways, yeah, the people who have not gone through it, you're, you're like, okay, I see that you, you think this now mm. and that you see things this way now. And I know why you do, because that, I, you know, same reason I did, yeah. you know, 10 yeah. years ago, 20 years ago. I do think that I look, some of the guys, they do make me smile. I think, yeah, mm. I, I, I think if we did this, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, I would probably be more similar to them. Now, now I'm a bit more wary, but then, you know, they're, um, I suppose in a way, it's a bit like being gay in some ways, isn't it? Because people are, even people like us, people are more free now to be who they are. Yes. Whereas when I was younger, if anybody had have thought for a minute that I had any kind of tendencies or that, they would have, for instance, they would never let me near their kids yeah. or anything like that. They'd have thought I'd have put them in a bath of boiling water or something. So, uh, yes, I must admit, they are, yeah, they do make me smile on this code, actually, I must admit. Yeah, you know, I still get that sometimes, like, oh, you know, I mentioned in the, I never did have children, I probably will not have children, but I mentioned no, in the book, yeah, maybe children. I will have kids or something, people are like, ah, that couldn't happen, whereas, you know, there's, um, I think maybe, maybe you've heard Patrick Gagney, I think is her last name, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, she, she wrote that New York Times Modern Love <laughs> about being a no, psychopath. Yes, children. Yeah, I, I, to be honest, I don't see that as an issue because I've got a large family and I've seen all kinds of people have kids. Right. And I think people like us would definitely have boundaries. And also you would be looking out for similar traits because when I look back, there were a good few times during my life where I could have done something really stupid. I could have ended up in jail. I could have ended up, you know, injured or killed because I would do quite daft things because again it was probably an echo sometimes I got into a crowd of guys who were into um climbing up cranes and and walking over pipes 20 feet in the air and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and I quite like that I I like the buzz of it I think it, it it sometimes takes a bit to get me going you know to get me sort of uh excited on something right so the idea of um, standing on a pipe where if you take a step off, you die instantly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I quite, I could, I could relate to that. I could get my instincts kicking in, which isn't a normal state for me. So I, things like that. So I, mean, I think people, if you raise, I don't, yeah, I'm, I don't think so. I think people who have tendencies would be excellent parents, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Especially- Especially excellent parents, it seems like, because uh, one one flaw I see in a lot of parents is over-identifying with their children, you know, like, oh, my, my children's yeah, success yeah. is my success. And honestly, even though you hear kind of like some some people say who claim to be psychopathic, like, oh, you know, everybody around me is my property or whatever, you know, I honestly don't <laughs> think <laughs> that mm. these people would be as invested in their children you know, that, that sort of way. And I almost think that's the, one of the most toxic things you can do as a parent. So, uh, you I know, a psycho- yes, I agree. Yeah, a psychopath wouldn't I mean, be that way because they, they, them, yeah. I think, I think they themselves has so, such a weak sense of identity and kind of, you know, don't really care when it comes down to it, what other people think about them. So I think they're much more likely to just let their kids, you know, let their boys wear dresses, let their girls, you know, sleep around. I don't know. <laughs> It's well, like... yeah, I, was I mean, I, I quite like to cross dress. I've done that a few times, and uh, I, I got caught once when I was 14, mm. or 15. I was in and with this girl I was dating, and I persuaded her to swap school uniforms. Yeah. So I wore her clothes and she wore mine, and we're in bed, and I got caught by her parents. 
Uh, Her parents were so, so fun. They were like that. They thought that she'd be psychologically scarred forever. <laughs> not even her idea. But anyway, so, we, so they agreed to keep it a secret and they're really like, you know, and they thought, you know, they, were, they thought they were blackmailing me with it. Like, mm. you know, you can keep quiet if we keep quiet. Uh-huh. I, thought, hmm, I don't really care. <laughs> you know, I really couldn't care less. I mean, I'd, I'd, you know, if people find out, they find out. I mean, it didn't bother me. And I see they had, but yeah, that, that, their reaction was a bit like that. They seen their daughter as some kind of um, reflection of them that had to be pristine and protected from the world. Right. That everything had to be perfect and she had to be perfect. And, and uh, that, you know, they, they, what did they call her? They called her some, was it, they called her Angelina, but it was after some saint or something. Mm-hmm. So, so that kind of thing. Yeah. So people like that, I think would be, would be uh, terrible, terrible parents. You're right. I don't agree with that, that thing where they make them, you know, they or that where they live through their kids, where they have all their ambitions. Right. They didn't achieve and they, they make the kid do whatever it was they did. Yes. Unfortunately, we don't hold interest that long. I mean, I don't think I would be. Yeah, I don't think I would care. I think people could do, people could do what they like, and once the kids were old enough to, you know, not hurt themselves, then the life would be their own business. Yes, exactly. Yes. But I suppose I'd be protective, though. I don't know. I mean, uh, if anybody hurt them, I'd probably kill them or something. Right. And that's, I think, what kind of like uh, the idea of somebody being like yours, like, I think that's what the psychopaths mean. They don't mean like, oh, they are my slave or they're a, f- a reflection on me. And a part of them. Yeah, that, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, they see them as an extension of themselves, which I suppose is a way to relate to others. Yes, because, uh, yeah, the, the bonds would be, they'd be different, I think, if I'm understanding. Again, I, I'm trying to be as, as objective and open as I can, not because obviously I spent most of my life covering up what I am rather than admit it. So I'm trying not to do that. So I'm trying to be as open and I don't really understand how other people think and feel. <laughs> I have no it's, idea. But I don't understand complex emotions really. Yeah. It's good for you to admit that. But so you say you're trying to be more open, more kind of, I mean, I think people might say something like true to yourself, you know, like, yeah. 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 And because why? Why have you started being that way? That's a very good question because I, I, I didn't, I don't know. It's not like I had a single incident, like a sort of blinding flash. It was more like over time, I uh, thought that maybe I could be more, well, well, I suppose, I suppose, yeah, cultural conditioning. I'd seen what we were as a bad thing, even though I'd never admit that. I seen it as because everything in culture kept telling me that people who think like I do were somehow bad people. Right. And they were responsible for the bad things in the world. And I came to realize that, okay, I'm never going to be a fluffy bunny. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I've seen people do a lot more terrible things than me. And they were, by all accounts, normal people. Right. Because we're, we're a small percentage of the population, as far as I can ascertain. We couldn't possibly be responsible for all the bad things that people see happening every day. I agree. So I suspect that's what it is. And maybe, like you said, it's just a male. Maybe it comes with age. I mean, I'm older now. I'm 57 now. Yeah. So time, times change and, and you just grow. Maybe society's shifted. I, I don't know. I might, I probably could ask a therapist that. Actually, it's quite a good question to ask, isn't it? What does she think? They don't like questions like that when you ask them, what do you think? Because they want to know what you think all the time. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me again, uh, how long have you been seeing your therapist for? I would say about oh, 18 months now. Uh-huh. A long time. Uh, but I, I started to get value out of it about a month in, maybe. Okay. And then I decided that I would keep going with it for a bit. I don't have any real uh, specific problem because that was one of the first things I asked. You know, I thought people went to therapy to fix something. Mm-hmm. But she said that's not necessarily the case. You can do it just to explore things and to uh, see how you're relating to things. And I also had my wife's back and she was quite interested for me to go and do that. Yeah. Because I do, if... Another thing I found I found was different is 
if I'm under a lot of pressure or there's a pressure situation, I tend to feel less. I know people say that when they're really tired, they get emotional. I don't, I get the opposite. If I get really tired or there's too much to do, I get quite unemotional. Yes. And I can be quite distant. It's been described as being um, detached. Yes. Um, this, this, uh, and that can be when you're with, you know yourself, when you're in a relationship, that can is not a good thing. Yeah. yeah I, I pull away from everybody. It's not, well, I tried to explain it. I'm not pulling away. I'm just not really there. <laughs> and again, this, this, this ties in with you. So I would say that was one of the fundamental differences I saw between us and the, the normal people. Yes. I remember I was in, a, I was in this, um, I was in a scout troop thing. It was, we were in this thing, we we're in the middle of a sort of forest somewhere. And we kind of got semi lost. So we ended up going up the wrong side of this mountain and it was huge. So we went this great big hill and down. So everybody at the bottom was all exhausted and all emotional. And, and it has made me quite good in crisis because I am the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't, you know, at least a bit emotional. I got everybody sorted out and got us all home, which is good because. I know I tend to use landmarks. I don't have any innate sense of direction that I can think about. I don't have any of those innate things. You when people talk about, um, I instinctively knew, or I uh, felt that this was the way to go, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That just sounds like poetry to me. Yeah. So I, I found that to be the case. And I was working in disaster recovery during 9-11 in computer disaster recovery for bank. Right. So I was actually near the Bank of England at the time. Now, when the planes were smashing into the buildings, they thought that maybe they were going to do it in other capitals around the world. Mm -hmm. So I remember then that was, but I was got all kinds of awards for that because everyone thought I was really brave. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not brave at all. It, it's not that. It's just I didn't really care. You know, yes. it's like I get to an acceptance point. Where I thought, well, if someone flies a plane into this building, there's no way we're getting out. <laughs> and I've, I've been to the Twin Towers I knew they were huge buildings so the, the, the building I was in was just vanished so in a way I was quite good at that because I just sort of thought well, you know we'll all get out yeah and it, so I just I was quite good at that that's funny because everyone thought I was brave but I went first they didn't remember that when oh. I came to leave in the building, yeah, there was an alert in the building and, and we're all, and I said, right, I had to lead people. So I kind of led people, they say that you led people out. I, I let them, you know, obviously I took the glory for that, it's fine. But I didn't lead people out. I was just the first one to leave. So that was kind of weird. It's kind of odd getting like accolades and things for stuff like that. Yes. Because they put a cool head under pressure. What else yeah. are you going to do? And the other one I find interesting, they, they say, like, is a much superficial charm, they said. I said, isn't all charm superficial? <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, so. It's, so, uh, it's funny you say this thing, um, when you get kind of busy, you get more, let's say, cold, you know, like less emotional. Cold. Uh, so Arya calls it lizard life. She says, uh, you know, hey, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just yeah. for the next couple hours in lizard life. And I'm like, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's interesting. Yes, that's exactly right. Like, it's like the lizard brain. I get very, very, um, I think very quickly as well. So when I'm trying to do something, I, I don't really have time for people to keep up. Mm -hmm. So I tend to just go on my own and do that. But yeah, that's a good description of it. It's it's very much like the lizard. I, I'm very efficient and very cool, yeah. but I'm very dismissive of people and, and I can be abrasive because I'm not putting on the charm, you see. I'm not trying to win them over. Yes. I'm distracted. Yeah. Whereas open and, and social circles or work circles, I'm always um, charming to everybody. Yeah. So mm. maybe you remember this. I talk about the same thing in the book about when I was sick with appendicitis, you know, yeah. I had a, my appendix had ruptured. I was also distracted, mm. you know, and so I was no longer putting on the charm and people, yeah, thought it was very off-putting the way I was behaving yeah, towards them. And you weren't afraid, were you as well? They thought once they told you what happened, you'd be like, oh no, I'm doomed. But you kind of didn't. Because, yes, that, that's true. I remember that very distinctly because I, I can understand that feeling where you just, 
you don't really pay attention to uh, physical things. I think that's something to do with awareness as well, because I've done that as well. Yes. And uh, I've done that as well. And sometimes in dangerous situations as well, I just don't really register them as much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was interesting. Like somebody once there was like a, I went to an area once where they had a, a beekeeper, and uh, they had and they had a. He said, if you walk calmly through the bees without a mask, they won't necessarily because they're used to human beings. Mm -hmm. So I was the only one who would try that. Parents <laughs> would do that sounds pretty cool, and it did work. Because uh, if you don't panic and run away, they just buzz around you, particularly bees, because if they sting you, it kills them. Yes. So that's something they do in a whim. So providing you're calm, but you can imagine it, this guy standing in the midst of all those bees. Everybody thought I was nuts. Yeah. But, it was cool. uh, but again, these are the kind of things I do in impulse. I just sort of thought I'd just do it and see what it's like. Yeah. Well, you know, the bee is in some way a good analogy to psychopaths. People are so afraid, you know, un almost unreasonably afraid of psychopaths the same way that they're afraid of yeah. bees or sociopaths. You know, I, I really don't make that distinction because I, I don't think there's a um, there consensus, anyone, yeah, about what it is, I you know. I don't think there is. One. I think that people also just become much more. Yeah. yeah, I'm Anyways. quite confident in, too, in this circumstance because... I'm being as honest as I can. And other ones I don't as a little bit of strategy because it sounds nicer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it sounds nicer. So they're so worried about psychopaths, like, oh, we're gonna be a victim, you know. If they know, mm -hmm. if they know I'm a psychopath, then it's like they're they're like, Oh, are you trying to victimize me? Are you trying to uh, manipulate me? And it's like, don't flatter yourselves. You know, yes, I have no yeah. desire to do anything to you. You're not even registering on like my attention span hardly at all. <laughs> yeah, I find it as well. Cause I, I would, I mean, the manipulation thing I would do more for a point, like when I was single looking for girls and stuff like that. Yeah. Or, or sometimes I would do it if just for like to deflate a particular person if <laughs> I thought they were being pompous or something. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I suppose we might do it on a sort of semi-subconscious level. You you tend to miss, but then I think everyone does that, isn't that what society? I mean, someone once asked me the question, "What is society based on?" And I said, "Society is based on um, manners." Yeah, we invented these ways of formal ways of addressing and dealing with each other because at the basic thing we are both predator and herd animal, and if we get it wrong we would end up just killing each other, which we do quite a lot. Mm. So, yeah. And, of course, people here at Psychopath, they assume we're going to be, you know, killing everything that moves or, or, like you said, trying to steal people's money or control their brain. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Brainwash them. <laughs> so I was just thinking, you know, as you're saying these things, uh, they just it's almost as if they don't understand the rules by which we live our life you know, because they're different and they can't kind of conceptualize what it is. And I'm thinking, you know, I've been watching from uh, the start, watching all the Star Wars movies, and it'd be like Definitely, trying to think, yeah. you know, what is it like for us? How, how could a Jedi still die? You know, or like in Harry Potter, you know, the book or the yeah, movie, like, you're like, can't they just use magic for everything? You well, know? Listen, I mean, yes, that's, I mean, I like fiction like that, like Star Wars, Harry Potter. I like Harry Potter because, you know, I mean, if I was Harry Potter, I'd spend most of my time just trying to get off with Hermione <laughs> and, and, and hide somewhere to Harry killed Voldemort. But that doesn't make for a good narrative. But yes, I mean, I, I like the idea of most fiction. I, I like the inconsistency of rules. I tend to like science fiction more than fantasy because I like the rules to be consistent. Like you said, you can't just make up a spell and with one bound, the hero is free. Yeah. And the best fiction writers, the best writers make, their own rules like jk rowling was very good at keeping the rules uh lucas was very good at his characters being jedis are very powerful but they're still people they make lots of mistakes right they you know they they, they can't just solve all the problems with a lightsaber so that was and of course they had a kind of religious uh, aspect to them as well but i quite like that analogy because you would have someone, it's a bit like Harry Potter. People once said to me, why is it such a strict environment in Harry Potter? 
But imagine every kid being born with a weapon of mass destruction inside them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, these kids can do a lot of damage. They've got these amazing abilities. So right. if they didn't have a set of formal rules, they would do a lot of damage. And maybe it is similar for us. I know that I operate under a code of rules. I suspect it's a bit more deliberate than most people's, but it's still there. I don't, do, I don't do anything simply to harm people. Yes. Yeah, Whether I, I'll prevent harm to people, that depends on the circumstances. Right. Yeah. I also have like a prosthetic moral conscience, I guess, yeah. of yeah. just rules where I'm like, kind of what we, you say, like manners. Manners is like, I am almost like, take manners to the extreme. You know, I try to be like as polite as possible whenever, because honestly, I don't want to be in a situation in which I'm pissed off and I feel a little bit out of control. No, that's true. I avoid that too. Yes, I is very much so. And it, it, it is deliberate with us, but that's fine. I don't think that's necessarily a problem. I think that that's okay if people understood that we are, un- I mean, in a sense, it's, it's harder for us than them. I mean, we're intelligent people. We're smart enough to compensate for these things. Not like sociopaths and psychopaths, any other human. Some of us are smart and some of us are not. Right. And the ones that aren't have a really tough time of it yeah. because they're actually victims of the society around them, but they're seen as the perpetrators because they can't see the, the complexities and the relationships around them. Like I sometimes watch um, rom-coms and soap operas just to watch how the people react. Yeah. And I never guess what they're going to do next. Obviously, they're exaggerated, which is why I like them, because they emphasize all the emotional reactions to each other and they emphasize the storyline. So it's a bit like remedial. <laughs> so I <can> like <laughs> listening. Yeah, you're learning Spanish and they're talking very um, slowly. <laughs> <laughs> they're talking like uh, Cambridge Dons. You know, everything's incredibly precise. And, yes. And, yeah, so that's... So I do that kind of thing as well. I've I've done that often. I I quite like like um, I've kept up as well. A lot of people grow out of it. I still like Star Wars, Doctor Who, Harry Potter. I, I love. I went to Warner Brothers Studio. It was really cool. Mm-hmm. And I just wandered around. And we went to. I took my wife. She decided to go to Harry Potter marathon. Uh-huh. So we watched all seven movies. With all these kids dressed up. And this guy came up to us and said to my wife, and I'd gone to get some a drink and I was coming back. And he's given her a hard time. And he goes, no, you're too old to be doing this stuff. <laughs> so I said, Expelliarmus. Because <laughs> 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 I was going to stop him. You know, and uh, I think my wife sometimes, to be honest, she's more embarrassed than anything else, which is something else I don't really get. But, you know, she sort of thinks, why do you do that? Why can't you just, you know, so I'm not arguing with that moron. He's just trying looking for trouble. And if you chase him away, mm-hmm. if you engage with him, he'll just give you trouble. Yeah. So I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I do think that uh, sociopaths are a little bit in a surprising way, like childlike. There is like a naivete, yeah. like an innocence that Absolutely. surprises people. But that's probably, mm-hmm. honestly, one thing that keeps your wife engaged with you is that she knows that there's not underneath it all maliciousness. There's underneath playfulness. There's yeah, underneath it all, I'm fairly harmless. That, yeah, I actually agree with that very much. You mentioned that in, in the Discord. I was watching, um, one thing it got to that I surprised on, she got it. We were watching Sex in the City. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's about these four girls in New York. Yeah, a little bit. I've seen like 10 yeah. episodes. She, she loves all that. So we're watching that. And there's well, that character, Mr. Big. He's he's the, the love interest of the main character. Right. And after about three seasons, she suddenly goes, the reason you keep doing that is because you don't love me. And mm. and I said, doesn't he love her? And she was like so shocked because you didn't know he didn't love her. And I said, no. <laughs> no, she, 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 she was like, she went, how can you not know that and i thought i didn't know he didn't and that's one thing she noticed because very emotional immaturity people have called it as well which i agree with yeah i have a, i mean the set i'm naive quite i mean i have to be um it surprises people a lot i don't 
have that awareness they have. I really don't. I take things at face value in yeah. cases like that. So the guy said he loved her through three seasons. I just think he did. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, he was doing all this, that, and the other one. I thought, jeez. So sometimes you laugh. So when I say things like, I don't know how you people get through the day. Yes. Yes. So it's funny you say this because, I mean, I've said this before and people are like, this is not a psychopathic trait. It's like autistic or something. But, you know, I think it's both is that I don't understand sarcasm very well. Like I have a tendency to take things literally and think that people are being sincere. Yes. Yes. I Or if it's in the right context, I can get it. But you're right. If someone says I wanted to be a chef because I think I'm the greatest cook in the world. Mm -hmm. I would think they meant they were the, they thought themselves to be one of the best cooks in the world. Exactly. Whereas, so yes, I, I would say like I did a test actually. We had uh, well they do expressions of faces. That's an autistic test because I said when I was young I didn't speak and even though I was very bright they thought there was something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. I also I engaged a lot, but I, I to be honest I I was bored. I didn't think these people were worth talking to, but I was clever enough not to say that. So they gave me the speech and had all these faces. And the, the expression. Now, I was okay with the main ones, happy, sad, miserable, angry. But the more subtle ones, I, I couldn't identify. And the therapist then told me, she says, well, that wasn't because of autism. It's because you don't understand the emotions behind them. Mm. So even because if they took the face away and brought it back, I'd remember it. I but see. I still couldn't identify what it was the person was trying to display. It was some ambivalent emotions, like, you know, if they're, if they're laughing when they're happy and, you know, when they're angry, they laugh or cry <laughs> when they're sleeping. I couldn't identify those at all. That's funny <laughs> because I've heard other psychopaths say that they, they can empathize sometimes if they have been in that exact same experience. It's almost like they, like they see somebody in that same experience and they're reflecting on their own experience. Like, oh, yeah. you, you know, you drop an ice cream cone. Oh, yes, I remember the time I dropped an ice cream cone. And then they feel like there's a little bit of empathy there. But even then, I don't think it's really empathy because you're just remembering yeah, your past experience. Experience. Yeah. That could be what the mellowing is as well. As you build up more experiences, you can relate them to. I mean, I did approach this, I and mean, I've had it in my wife as well. She convinces me to it. How do we really know that? I don't really believe that what I feel at that time is exactly what that person feels in that circumstance. Right. And she'll say, "Yes, it is." And I'll say, <laughs> "Is it?" And and she, you know, and I think also. Do you think emotions are easier for empathic people? I mean, the little thing I was pointing out and I was going through is emotions cost me effort. I have to do them rather than they just appear. Right. Even when I get angry, it's usually keyed off by specific circumstance. So, and it's usually because there some things prevent me doing something I want to do. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's some kind of fiery emotion resulting from some the way they're treating someone else or, or something like that. It's all internal reactions. And it could be why it doesn't last in Europe. It's probably just a, a adrenaline surge rather than anything else. Well, it sounds a little bit like you don't have an innate sense of direction. You know, you, uh, so you have to look for the landmarks, you know, like you have to actually kind of do the mental math, whereas other people might just naturally be like, oh, that's north. They did, yes, exactly. And, and it's very, very, it's very, it's fun to, it's fun to um, to see that I, I can see it like I've learned to recognize like say intuitive people do fascinate me it was to the point where this lady was like she pretended to be a psychic but she wasn't a psychic but she was very highly sensitive she could pick up on people's moods and emotion and we're sitting there watching it and we're in this sort of spiritualist thing because we like going to them well I go to all these things because they fascinate me because I don't believe in any of it Mm -hmm. But I go along to these things. Plus, I've got quite a background. My mum, my family's quite religious, so they've got a religious background. And, and um, you know, I, I respect other people's beliefs probably more than empaths do. Because, yeah. you know, I think people can believe what they want to believe. You know, surprisingly, although it would be in rare, I could actually be wrong. So I got these things, and, and, and I was like, literally, because you're staring at her like she's a kitten or something. You know, because I was like looking at this, because I was fascinated by how she could 
get information from that just with no real clues. Yeah. Now I can fake it, as I've said, you probably do it yourself, particularly being a lawyer, you've been trained in specific methods of analysing and, and recognising when people are telling the truth, whether they hide things, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I kind of do it that way. I have learned tricks to try and identify what people are, because like office environments with office politics, yes. I am terrible at that. I get better at the political bit over time. But something like an office romance, I will have no idea about that. <laughs> Me too. I had a best friend who was involved in an office romance. Other people knew about it, and I didn't know about it. I was like, how could I not? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. People, and then they go, they say things like, um, well, everybody knew that. It was obvious. Why was it obvious? Nobody said anything. Yeah. But yeah, that kind of thing, I'm completely blank at, which, which amuses people. So I, I have to be careful. And pull that being said, I can enjoy office politics because then they kind of are attacking me in a way. And once they start doing that, I just respond and <laughs> manipulate them any way that, that comes to mind. And it's usually pretty easy because people who are bullies are, tend to be quite fragile, I found. Mm. So when they do that, I can, I usually sort of get my own way in that way. I've also, but, yeah, done something similar where I've almost intentionally provoked them to attack me out in the open to then now I'm like, mm -hmm. well, I have to respond to everybody. <laughs> you know? That is, I think that, I think in some ways that's a, a female trait. You've, you've got ways of dealing with people that I don't, like you mentioned in your book, how you can dress a certain way and act a certain way. And that sends signals to men. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I'm in, I haven't looked up in Google, by the way, because, you know, it's, I don't, uh, you asked me not to, so I didn't, uh -huh. which is not something I do for everyone. <laughs> so um, so, I, I, so I think you're, you're probably, I can't read your book, you're quite attractive and you dress away and, and you can invoke, particularly from males, you'll get a certain reaction. You know, it would work. That kind of thing would work on me, by the way. I, I would just, like, if, if I was a spy, I'd probably fall for the first honey trap they put me in. I agree. I'm also susceptible, really susceptible to manipulation. I'm like a very impressionable person. Yes, I can be that way as well. I, I can, I can, again, maybe it's something to do with the fact of taking people at face value as well. Yes. I mean, if someone's a con man, I can, I would, I can tell by the environment. But if some, pretty lady was to try and seduce me to get secrets I would probably see it as a fair bargain because <laughs> so, <laughs> I did go through a test actually I tested for MI5 they were recruiting people and they went around and I got really quite far down it but they, they did a bit on patriotism uh -huh. where they had to say why your country was better than the other country uh -huh. and I kind of stalled on that because studying the intelligence services across the world they're all the same right and I did some brief, uh, had some brief dabbling in the military because I tended to dabble with everything. I had all kinds of professions, even worked in a circus for a year. Uh -huh. So I did all these bits. And I remember this, this sergeant, he'd been everywhere. He's an American. He'd been all over the place. He'd been every major engagement. And he didn't want to be an officer, a real military type. And he said to me that I was talking about terrorism. And he said, terrorist is what the big army calls a little army. <laughs> Anything that anybody's done has been done before by somebody else. And I thought that was interesting. I thought that's a very empathic thing because the that idea that what you're doing is better than what someone else is doing because like they did it to you first or mm -hmm. you did it. But then I, I mean being honest, I can be quite hypocritical as well. Yeah. Because if it keeps me off swap, I can see hypocrisy in other people. Uh, but I think somebody mentioned that in Discord about hypocrisy, I, and she was—I think it was North. She mentioned about how we don't like hypocrisy. What I think it is, though, is I don't like uh, that any hypocrisy I indulge in is deliberate. I know I'm doing it because it's for a purpose. Other people tend to be hypocritical, and then they're not aware of it, or they don't admit that they're aware of it. Yes, and I can find that quite annoying, which is why most politicians, I think, are are useless. Yeah, I think 
And I think it's one thing too. I think it's like moral hypocrisy versus ethical hypocrisy because, you know, so again, I'm taking these continuing legal education classes and legal ethics is not what you would think, you know, it's not just acting like a good person, you know, because it's, it's just such a weird field. You know, you're representing people that you may know to be guilty, you know, you're, but they still have the right to have uh, assistance of counsel, you know? So it's just like, it's not kind of what you think. Uh, So I think that there is like ethical hypocrisy in the legal field all the time, you know, because it's just like, well, you're balancing conflicting, like inherently conflicting interests. But the thing I really don't like is moral hypocrisy. And I think it's partly because I'm like, well, you know, it'd be one thing, you know, for people to be like, you're you're an evil person, you know, and then to be entirely consistent with that belief. But they're not. They're not. They never are. The people calling psychopaths evil are like, it seems like they're often the worst of the moral hypocrites yes because they're doing the type of thing they would accuse us of maybe they're doing it for different motivations but the result is the same exactly because they are not classed as a psychopath by society they can somehow justify what they're doing whereas we're not even allowed to have a justification we're some kind of monster yes and i think they intentionally try to simplify issues. I think a lot of the, yeah. what do we call it? Cancel culture is this. They intentionally try to simplify yeah. an issue to the, it's like black and white, you know, evil and good or something. And I just think everything's so complicated. You know, like the other day I was mm. reading this tweet and it was like, you know, of course we shouldn't let professional athletes jump the line to get vaccines. You know, like it shouldn't have to be said, but apparently it does have to be said. And then this person provided no arguments for it, you know, then kind of supported it by saying they make a lot of money. And since they like make a lot of money, they can afford precautions. But I thought, you know, I would really like to see some actual statistics about how many professional athletes have been exposed and or infected, because it seems like it's higher than someone like me who just works from home, you know? So like, I, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I think the cancel culture thing is very, very odd. It's, yeah, I mean, people, yeah, I, I agree. I don't, I think that someone's justification for being vaccine has to be the bigger picture. For example, the sports people, if they're doing their job, mm-hmm. doing their sport, performing, that is the trickle down from that. And a lot of different people live off of that. The industry Absolutely. It keeps people... Uh, it helps people's mental health or it helps uh, yeah it helps other people's mental health I must admit lockdown doesn't bother me that much I find it a little boring sometimes but it doesn't particularly trouble me Mm -hmm. whereas my wife keeps saying some people are are finding it stressful which is weird they're suffering yeah houses with beer and telly oh yeah (laughs) <laughs> I have a friend who's, uh, you know, like just told me yesterday, she's in like a depressive, co- chronically depressive state, had to take a mental health day yesterday. And it's like, why? You know? <laughs> what? Yeah. And the, the thing about stress and depression, I've known people who have, it's a bit like alcoholism. I've known people who are alcoholics and it's a very different thing from being an alcoholic and being a heavy drinker. Hmm. I think it's like that. People go on about stress and depression and, and you know, and how it, co- I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I've never really been depressed, I don't think. I tend to be fairly level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can be volatile. I suppose, yeah, again, it's labels, isn't it? Because once upon a time, if they said someone was depressed, it would be a clinical thing. They'd have a, a condition of some suppressed serotonin, oxytonin problems, and they may need therapy or they may require some medication. And then it's just things like, if you're stuck at home and you're frightened of a pandemic, that isn't anxiety. That's just your instincts telling you to stay alive. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man, I like that. Yeah, because I'm... (laughs) <laughs> so we, we've uh, we've been talking now I think for like I don't know an hour ish or something uh, mm-hmm. and I, I want to get more information from you about therapy what you mm-hmm. found was useful what types of things that your therapist has you do if you don't mind sharing no, it's it's fine um, well the first thing I had to do is I went in uh, I was introduced in, and she said that um, uh, we'll look at your behavior in the past and what you're doing with and how you deal with stress or or major situations. So my father died about a year ago and uh, I had a 
complex relationship with my father because he was a, a very, um, I think, quite an intuitive person. Mm. He was very um, sensitive, which, which strange enough wasn't a good thing to be in Glasgow when he was young. Right. So he'd built up quite a lot of walls. So he could be very aggressive and being aggressive with someone like me can be quite volatile. Mm -hmm. So she goes, how she goes, so she did, so she said, um, okay, so pick something in your life that you think is a significant event in your life that you think shaped the, the person you are. And then uh, what did that, what did you think of that? What did you feel of that? And so we went through some, some bits and pieces on that, what I felt about how my dad died and how I was affected. And I had tended to stay away from the family during this time. Mm. Make up, go. Cool. Are you there? Yeah. yeah. I thought my screen had froze. Yeah, so I tended to stay away from the family during this time because, like I said, when I, I tend to withdraw, and they were all having quite an emotional time of it because we've got a large family and he was like papa to my sisters who have like, you know, I'm a, I think I'm a granddad now. So they, they, um, she asked me how I dealt with that, what I felt. And she also asked me things like other areas in your life where you'd like to see a change. And so sort of, I couldn't think of anything off my head. I, I, I was pretty terrible at therapy at the beginning. Mm hmm because I didn't really know how to open up and I didn't really see the value in it. Right. Over time, she was very good at gradually taking me through it. I mean, I think 18 months might be a long time for some people, but to me, that's how long it takes to get me to be open. The benefit of it is the conversation we're having now. Mm. I would never have had this before therapy. In what way? Just, well, I would have seen it as being... An exposure. I mean, I never ever spoke about myself in any context. Even stuff like they say, "What did you do in the summer at school?" I would always make it a story, like wow. I was kidnapped by aliens or something. Mm -hmm. I'm never very good at opening up exactly what I'm thinking and feeling. Time, and I think it's a defense mechanism because there's not a lot there. You know, I don't have those intense things to portray. So we, we examined that. We examined, um, she said, what do I think about things in general? We did some general stuff and she, she, um, she asked me to take instances from the past, as she said, and then an instance from the future uh, and compare them to see how I maybe changed over the years. And eventually she, she said to me that this process was because she was trying to get me to accept the fact that my level of self-awareness was low and that I wasn't really aware of what I was being motivated by, yeah. which to me seemed like the opposite because of the way I was. I always had presumed that I was driving, I was in the driving seat all the time mm -hmm. and that I wasn't uh, being influenced by anything that I didn't control. Right. And uh, so I, I came to the realisation that I was making the same mistakes over and over because of the nature of my uh, psychopathy, basically. Which, again, was, was clever how she did that, because uh, talking about now, had she tried that approach in the first few months, I probably would have shut down, or I'd have started playing games with her mm -hmm. and just fed her answers that she was looking for. Yeah, You know, look, looked up, whatever. But she was very clever, though. She avoided using specific um, methods, and she avoided using specific schools of psychology because <laughs> she knew I'd go, she knew I'd go and look those up, and mm -hmm. then I would, you know, I would start uh, playing with them. But I, I didn't, though. I have to admit, I didn't. I did try to make it work, and it was. I would rec 